Thank you very much, uh, Simon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have no disclosures for this uh, presentation. So uh, um, I'm going to speak about speckle tracking echocardiography, which is a new technique. It's about 10 years now uh, that it started, and uh, we are moving from uh, simple uh, velocities to uh, more complicated parameters like uh, strain, and uh, from uh, MI to ischemia, and hopefully even viability. So uh, just for you, those of you who are not uh, familiar with the technique, uh, we have known for a very long time that uh, ultrasonic images uh, contain speckles. And you can see those speckles. I hope you can see them here. Uh, but now with the modern uh, uh, computer technology, we are able to uh, track these speckles, excuse me, and follow them as they move from one location to the other location. And if we know the time that has elapsed from, for this mo motion, then actually we are able to calculate the velocity. And if we look at the velocities at the several areas um, along the left ventricle, both in the longitudinal and as I'll show you in circumferential and even radial uh, directions, then we can calculate a parameter which is strain, which is really the deformation of the ventricle. Uh, so, uh, uh, the first publication, uh, clinical publication, uh, the, this idea was actually born at the Technion Institute of uh, Health and uh, very quickly was acquired by one of the uh, vendors and implemented as a, as a clinical uh, software. Now you can, you can get that in all vendors' uh, uh, clinical machines. Uh, but uh, our co-chairman, Shimon Reisner, here is the first who uh, published in JAST about 10 years ago uh, the, ob the clinical observation that you can, this is obtainable in, in humans, and uh, our paper followed two, two months later in the same journal, uh, and we were able to differentiate or, already at that very early paper between normal subjects and patients with myocardial infarction, and this is displayed here, and we compared the uh, our results to what was gold standard at that time, uh, Doppler tissue imaging, uh, which is a very nice technique, but only if you use it within the Doppler limits, which is, as you know, uh, it's limited to 20 degrees, otherwise uh, uh, the results are uncertain. So uh, uh, you can use the Doppler tissue imaging in the longitudinal axis, and actually our results with the speckle tracking were pretty much the same. Uh, and uh, you can see that the strain levels are lower uh, than uh, normal strain. Uh, so uh, this uh, study, which came uh, just a bit after, uh, took it uh, one step further. Uh, this is a very important study by Amundsen. Uh, this study had two parts. The first is experimental part where they used uh, uh, nine dogs and they, implement, uh, they put their uh, crystals, which as you know are considered to be the gold standard for motion uh, of the ventricle, and they were able to show that speckle tracking follows very uh, closely uh, the, the uh, intramyocardial uh, ultrasonic crystal data. So uh, that is uh, sort of a proof that indeed uh, this technique can uh, show motion very effectively. And they uh, went a little bit further, and they started the clinical study where they compared the results of uh, uh, speckle tracking information to tagged MRI, which uh, uh, you will hear about a little bit uh, later during this session, which is, of course, considered to be the gold standard. And once again, you can see pretty nice correlation between speckle tracking and MRI data, uh, so uh, uh, this uh, further enhances the uh, uh, possible utility of this uh, technique. Now, I think uh, this uh, study will uh, really show uh, uh, how accurate the technique is. Uh, the, this is uh, a multi-center uh, effort, uh, mostly European. Uh, however, the Americans are involved in that as well. Uh, this is really, I'm not going into great detail of that, it's uh, led by one of the leading figures, uh, Dr. Boyd, uh, to really standardize the technique by using uh, different technicians and different uh, states 
and compare blindly the results of uh, speckle tracking results, mainly strain, and um, this is uh, going to be published very soon now, and actually the results, uh, I'm familiar with the results, but I cannot show it to you. So this is really how it looks, um, and uh, I just want you to pay a very careful uh, attention because I'm going to speak about some of these parameters. Can you show it again? Because uh, I don't know what happened. Um, disappeared. Oh, here we go. Uh, okay. Uh, what you see here is a basal region of the left ventricle, short axis cats, of course, and this is apical region. And if you look carefully, and I hope you can look carefully because it just <laughs> tends to disappear, um, can you put it on again? Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to see that uh, while the basal portion of ventricle moves clockwise, the apical region moves anticlockwise. So it's a, a different uh, motion pattern, and you can, if you will be able to, if you will be able to see it, then you'll be able to see that the endocardial and epicardial regions move in different direction as well. And uh, there is good explanation for that. And I'll show it to you. Please look carefully. This is clockwise, and this is anticlockwise. So, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> as, a, as a matter of fact, this has been investigated quite carefully by Sengupta and now, and he, uh, 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 you'll see the nomenclature of this uh, type of motion uh, of the heart. Uh, rotation is the base and apex which rotate in opposite directions. And this can be calculated in, uh, uh, in angles uh, by, uh, by a term which is called twist, which is the absolute apex to base difference in rotation. And uh, you can even calculate torsion, which is apex to base gradient in the rotation angle. And uh, this is, uh, I think, very exciting, at least for research. Uh, I'm not 100% uh, that uh, this will have a lot of clinical application, but apparently there is. And, uh, and the first clinical study which tested this is uh, uh, this study by Park et al. Uh, this, what you see here, is normal uh, patients where they calculated apical rotation as 14.5 degrees, basal rotation uh, minus 6.8, and the net twist of the heart is uh, 21 degrees. Now, this is a patient with the anterior myocardial infarction where apical rotation is much less, about half of uh, uh, normal. Uh, basal rotation is increased because of probably some compensatory motion that you can see here. And so the net L, which is somewhat lower, but not uh, really very different from normal. And this is patient with inferior MI where the apical rotation is about uh, as normal, uh, but basal rotation is significantly decreased. Uh, so. Uh, uh, there might be some uh, clinical implication of this motion, but it's still being investigated and uh, not quite sure what is the uh, outcome uh, 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 result of that. This is another study where they uh, studied 44 patients with MI, this is Banza Leal, and 41 without. Uh, they performed the dobutamine stress echo with the STI and they calculated torsion and the rotation of the heart. Uh, and the LV torsion related to infarct size, not that much to, uh, to sight, but the torsion appeared to be an independent determinant of uh, resting function uh, and not influenced by ischemia. So next I would like to share with you uh, not American football, uh, although this is an illustration of American football, but uh, the idea is uh, that this was illustrated by a guy named Ernie Ball, Barnes, who actually participated in uh, American football. He was a lineman, uh, and he became an artist at the age of 70. And he calls this uh, illustration layers of strain. So uh, why am, am I showing it to you? Because uh, the left ventricle, indeed, as I have shown you already, or hinted in uh, uh, the... Uh, um, film that I showed you, the left ventricle, now, we know now, uh, has three layers, uh, or uh, uh, we have known that for a very long time, but we now know how these layers actually contract and relax during systole and during diastole. And we know that uh, the uh, endocardial, mid and epicardial layers, they contract in different angles 
and endocardial and epicardial layers are mainly longitudinal, while the mid wall is circumferential primarily. And you can see that the endocardial uh, uh, fibers rotate in a right-handed helix, which is uh, illustrated here, uh, while the epicardial uh, fibers rotate in a left-handed uh, So it's a very complex motion that our heart here in the room uh, contract and relax uh, every second. And this is illustrated here in this uh, picture, which I think is uh, a little bit complex because it uh, shows you all the phases of the uh, uh, heart cycle, the isovolumic contraction, the ejection, the isovolumic relaxation, and early diastole. It shows you the subepicardial and subendocardial layers all along these illustrations and how the ventricle moves in any phase of the cardiac cycle, which is, as uh, can be displayed here, very complex indeed. And uh, we are studying and learning it all the time. And I'm sure our colleagues from MRI are dealing with that uh, uh, very frequently. So we actually uh, uh, <clears throat> applied for the first time a, a software developed uh, for this purpose to, to try to uh, identify all three layers. Well, I'm not that sure that we are really able to detect the mid layer of the ventricle, but we certainly are able now to differentiate between the endocardial and epicardial regions, both in myocardial infarction and in normals, and they are clearly different in strain. And this was published uh, some time ago. Uh, and there is another publication for a German group uh, uh, confirming exactly the same result. And uh, uh, if we take it one step further, perhaps we can even differentiate between subendocardial infarction, which is displayed here in a nice MRI image, and this is the speckle tracking image uh, in correlation. Uh, this is the speckle tracking strain image, and you can see that the region of uh, infarction is different than uh, the normal uh, segments. And this is, of course, a transmural myocardial infarction displayed very nicely here by MRI scar tissue. And this is the correlated uh, um, segment uh, um, uh, by speckle tracking. And of course, the trace is completely different. Uh, the area of the infarction is much lower. And if you can have a look here, it's already, uh, there is a hint that uh, the, the strain comes a little bit later, and I'll speak about that. And this is just the area under the curve, which Phil Grunan showed you in the other uh, uh, study, but uh, it shows the difference between subendocardial and transmural infarction. And uh, we studied uh, this uh, um, in, in rats, uh, together with our colleagues from, uh, from the Technion. Uh, <clears throat> these were uh, uh, <clears throat> 24 rats subjected, uh, excuse me, 24 rats uh, subjected to LED occlusion for 30 minutes, and then reperfusion was allowed. 13 was risk, uh, were scanned at 24 hours, while 11 rats at two weeks. So uh, uh, you have a difference here. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, just the summary of the uh, histological and the speckle tracking uh, displays of 24 hours and two weeks, uh, subendocardial and transmural. And uh, uh, the blue uh, color uh, uh, yields a contraction, yellow and orange stretching, and the green is zero value. And uh, I don't want to, uh, this is a very complex slide, which I will not uh, try to even to explain to you. This apex papillary muscle mitral valve, this is the endocardium, mid-layer, epicardium, and the different segments. Uh, so it's, it's quite complex. Uh, I will summarize it for you. The endocardial layer is more sensitive to MI size in acute phase, 24 hours, but not after two weeks. So that may already uh, hint or implicate uh, some information regarding viability. But uh, I think the next uh, uh, parameter, which is the last that I will speak about, perhaps will uh, uh, take us even one step further, and this is the time that the strain really occurs. And uh, uh, we call it time to peak strain. And uh, I will show it to you. Uh, this, is, uh, 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 this is a strain trace. 
and you can actually calculate it. You use the electrocardiogram. You, you of course, have to uh, uh, normalize it with the electrocardiogram, but you can see here there is some delayed peak, although the magnitude of strain is similar. So uh, this is the first study by uh, Asanuma that showed that this may be a very important parameter. This is normal strain. The red is the anterior wall. The blue is the posterior wall. This is baseline. These are dogs uh, subjected to uh, uh, ischemia, to occlusion of the uh, LAD. And uh, this is during occlusion. You can see that strain in the, in the anterior wall is much less and significantly delayed as opposed to posterior wall. This is 10 minutes reperfusion. The magnitude of strain already recovered, but there is still delay, and it takes 60 minutes to recover completely in terms of time frame. And uh, uh, we studied that in a pig model. Uh, this paper is currently under uh, revision and will be published hopefully within the next few months. Uh, this is 90-minute LAD occlusion followed by reperfusion, and we measured circumferential strain and also radial strain at baseline, 90 minutes, 2 hours, 30 and 60 days, and we measured not only peak strain but time to peak strain and with the correlation with histology. I will not show all the results, of course, because it's preliminary and has not yet published, uh, <clears throat> but you can see very nicely that, uh, uh, indeed, the time to peak strain uh, is, uh, a, is a very important parameter, and we correlated that with histological cuts of transmural versus non-transmural myocardium, and just briefly to show you that indeed time to peak strain appears to be the best parameter to predict a tissue that is deemed to recover uh, sometime after occlusion as opposed to a muscle which uh, will remain scarred. So uh, that's where we are right now. And of course, these are experimental studies, yet not clinical. We need a lot more experience in terms of uh, uh, reproducibility, in terms of uh, clinical uh, uh, exposure and uh, validation, and of course, um, a correlation with MRI results. But I believe that speckle tracking technique has come a long way in a relatively short time, only 10 years and uh, it may provide quantitative information definitely on infarcted myocardium and hopefully even on uh, important issues such as viability uh, of the muscle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Will.